Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Decently Indecent, episode 20. Always a privilege uh, to have you tune in here, whether it's on video on Storyfire, on YouTube, maybe you're listening on Spotify. 20 weeks now. It's been a few more than 20 weeks. Some of you know I took last week off. I was on a short vacation to Martha's Vineyard for a much-needed reset, time away with the family and some friends. Really had a great time. But I want to talk about a few things today, and I'll give you a little synopsis, kind of a heads up if you're curious. I want to be candid just about a few things going on in my own life and my businesses, my YouTube channels, nothing dire, just uh, for those of you interested in some of the things that are going on behind the scenes as someone who owns a YouTube business and uses it to support his family. There's a lot of moving parts, obviously. And also I wanted to, you know, just because it's kind of Kind of topical right now. Touch touch on the the current summer games, the Olympics right now happening in France over in Paris. I just uploaded a video today to my Leon Lush YouTube channel about the Olympics, where I was just touching on a few of the various memes and the the popular topics that were viral this week, um, and a couple of the controversies. It's interesting. So f- first of all, let me let me let me start this off. You know, for, hold on a second. Pause. Pause. I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Jesus, Leon. Uh, what we have here in this globe, this decanter globe, if you're watching, just a little bit of Jameson, just a simple Irish whiskey. We like to pour a little bit of that. I feel like there's such a such a beautiful simpleness, a little solitude, and just a, a small pour of whiskey to use that as an aid to help kind of reflect and chat and talk. You know, when before I started this podcast, however, four four or five months ago now. I hadn't done much long form. I had never done any long form content that was just me and a microphone. And of course I've had some guests on uh, in the past and I really enjoy having conversations with other people, but you know, where I'm just at with the podcast and in my life, it's hasn't been feasible to have a guest every week. Of course, I'm going to continue to try to get people on, but I've also been enjoying doing these solo episodes because it's been kind of a challenge to myself to really tap into who I am and what it is that makes me me because uh, you know a lot of what you see on my other YouTube channels is it's me I try to be as authentic as I can but it's obviously a little bit planned and there's editing that goes on where it's like multiple takes maybe sometimes I'm delivering a joke I do it more than once so this is really for the most part for all intents and purposes this is just kind of like one long take if something comes up or you know I let out a mean fart or something, you you know, we'll edit that out, but it's been a wonderful challenge just because it's, it's more difficult than what I'm used to. You know, I've been doing other, I've been doing YouTube videos for years and years and years and to sit down and just be like, Hey, this is who I am. Let's talk about this, uh, in a manner in which I'm going to say what's on my mind and I'm not going to try to sugarcoat things or pretend, uh, I feel a certain way about something. And this is what I think. I think it's been good for me because listen, you know, I started doing YouTube a long time ago. I've gone through several iterations of content and how I make things and what I put out there. And on YouTube, one year is like five years of real life. It feels like, I mean, the internet just moves so fast, you know, channels come and go, YouTubers come and go, subscribers come and go, views come and go all of these things. The only thing that's really sustained me for these years, you know, and I think at this point I've had a longer YouTube career than most. (laughs) And I have no idea what it's going to look like in one, three, five, 10 years. But the one thing that sustained me is always trying to be as genuine as possible in how I deliver content and how I deliver who I am and present myself and just being consistent. That's been enough to I mean, give me such a wonderful decade, man. Like, I'm just so blessed. So like, if I go into any details or I talk today about any things I'm dealing with right now on a personal level or what I see for the future of the channels as, as I, as I get closer inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter to age 40 (laughs) in less than a year, um, don't take that as me complaining. It's just me being honest about my thoughts. Um, I'll never take for granted the run I've had in these years I've had and and the life I've been given. Thanks to so many of you guys listening right now. You know, I know this podcast, it's not a big podcast by any means. And it's easy, especially someone who's been doing this a long time. It's really easy to get caught up in 
outward facing vanity metrics, views and listens and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, it's fun when one does really well, but you know, like so much of my other content, some of my favorite, some of the, some of the, some of my favorite content that I've made in the last seven, eight, nine years has been the content that has got the least amount of views. And that's just kind of the nature of how it goes. You know, I've never, I've, I've obviously had to play the game of like, Hey, let's talk about this thing that has the potential to get clicks because it's trending. Or let's talk about this idea because I think it's preposterous and probably can make a clickable thumbnail, et cetera. But I've also made a lot of content just about stuff that I found <laughs> interesting and that might not be that remarkable, which is oftentimes the content that just goes under the radar. But all of that is to say, I know that beyond all of that, beyond the the roller coaster, the ups and downs, the hills and valleys of views and these metrics and all these things I've kind of dealt with over the years, I always feel so blessed to have even a handful of people listening to me, you know, a couple hundred views in a podcast, a couple thousand views of people willing to give me their time to sit here and listen to me talk about whatever is just such a, an, an incredible blessing. And, I, and I'll never take that for granted, regardless of how things go in the future. Uh, anyway, so it's, this isn't going to be somber. There's nothing really, there's nothing bad going on in my life. I'm uh, actually in a, a pretty good place right now. But when you're in this kind of business for a while, you can you can definitely go through challenges as far as how you're dealing with it from a mental standpoint. Um, you know, I know we've all seen over our years as YouTube consumers kingpins fall like dominoes because they just got chewed alive by the constant pack of hyenas that are circling on the internet waiting to pounce, whether it's in the comment section or whether it, whatever the fuck it is, the grind of feeling like if you're not uploading, you're not doing something, you're going to become irrelevant. There's always people that are out there that are hungrier than you. It's no different than sports, right? It's like, you're the old guy in the room there's going to be young kids that are innovating and smarter and hungrier and have a lot less to lose and are just going to be, and that's just how it goes, right? So as a YouTuber who's damn near 40, I'm definitely an anomaly in a sense, it, at least maybe in my genre. So I'm kind of in that period of time for me where I'm like, what is, who is Leon Lush and what is he going to be in three years? What is he going to be in five years, 10 years? And I think a lot of you or any of you that have, have been around for any extended period of time have probably seen some of the progression in my content from where I was in 2016, 17, early kind of edgy commentary days and how that's changed over the years. I like to think for the better, some of the things have stayed the same, but some of it's grown up with me because it has to, like you just, as you grow up as an individual, hopefully you're growing as a person too. And I've fucking started a family since I began YouTube. I had a child since I began YouTube. So many things. I mean, eight, nine years is a very long time. So I'm in an interesting place because speaking on the on my my own personal channel, you know, it, it has been <laughs> such a huge journey. For those of you that don't know, it started in 2008 <clears throat> and I was uploading music covers. I wanted to be a musician, fresh out of college. I'm not going to go. I mean, there's a video on my main channel about the whole history of that. But sometime around 2008 is when I really made the decision. I left my corporate job and I knew that that type of life just wasn't for me. I needed to find a way to have a creative outlet and express myself and do something that was creative. And hopefully, you know, if I worked hard enough at it, I could, I could make a living doing it. And for years, that was, that was being a musician. That was gigging in bars as a solo acoustic musician. That was uploading a couple hundred covers to YouTube, many of which are privated now. That was joining a band for five years and doing some local New England tours and putting out an EP and an album, playing to rooms of people. I mean, just so many incredible experiences. But all the while working in restaurants to support myself because as, as, as fun as it is to dream and want to be that guy that's like, you know, <laughs> if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life, right? <laughs> like, like there's ever been a more bullshit statement than that, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's it, uh, The flip side of that is when you turn what you love into your work, you start to hate what you love. <laughs> I say that facetiously, but there's an element of truth to that. For in people that are in creative arts know what I'm talking about. Ask anyone who's like 
Ask any streamer that plays video games for a living, any big streamer that streams video games 40 hours a week. You think they're playing video games when they're not streaming? <laughs> not many of them. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. That's why. Um, anyways, you know, I like to go on tangents. So I get a little sidetracked to where I was going, but uh, basically the different iterations. So it wasn't until, um, you know, so that was, that was a long period of time. And then uh, come 2015, 16, I, I realized the music thing at the time, I was like, well, this isn't financially viable. It's like, I, whatever, I'm always was trying to figure it out. I'm like, all right, I want to find a way to leave the restaurant and do something full time. And that turned into to 2016, 17, just trying a bunch of different shit, throwing pickles at the wall, seeing what sticks. I've said that on this podcast before. It's a phrase I like. I don't know why. I mean, I, there was a weird period of time where I was making like motivational Instagram content. Like I was just just learning. I was learning. I was learning how to edit. I was doing everything. And finally I fell into the commentary thing and I found out, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty good at talking into a microphone and making jokes into the camera and being animated and drawing upon my years of growing up watching Jim Carrey and Chris Farley and these kind of very animated characters. And early on in that, uh, commentary phase two, I was taking elements of my musicianship where I was making diss tracks and uploading covers and alongside the commentary stuff that I think helped set me apart and build an audience. So there's been so many, there's been so many different phases and iterations of what I've done. There's been a lot of luck involved. And then <clears throat> finally I had a few videos that did really well in 2018 where I was eventually, uh, eventually able to, to go full time on YouTube. And, and I've never looked back since. And I've had just a very, a very blessed career that has had lots of ups and downs, but I've, I've always been able to lean on the fact that I have been blessed with a talent that is is camera presence and being able to turn criticism into comedic commentary in a way. I mean, that is that has always kind of been my strength. So I think earlier on, I was when I was still doing a lot of the editing, I was using the editing piece as my vehicle to get super creative. And, you know, I was not doing a lot of scripting. It was mostly just like watching stuff and trying to come up with funny ways to react or segue things together. And then using the editing portion as part of the punchlines in a lot of ways. And that's changed a lot over the years, but it's always kind of relied on the backbone of what I call critical commentary. You know, if you, if you look at my channel in the last seven or eight years, you'll see a lot of the, the theme of like, hey, this thing sucks. Let's talk about it. Let's kind of uh, be miserable together as we watch it. Misery loves company type of beat. And then I try to find a way to make it entertaining as a po and not just super inflammatory. And now I'm close to 40 and I'm like, is this, uh, you know, I'm good at this, but how, like there, there's this part of my, there's, there's part of me, like this part of me inside. And you may have seen this like at the end of last year, I'm kind of conflicted. I have this, I have this, this moral, conflict because part of me knows that like I'm creating entertaining content that a certain amount of people around the globe enjoy. And I'm proud of that, but I'm also using the vehicle of negativity to do that. And I've always justified it. And I think it's justifiable because I think, I think I do it in a way that is walks the line of sarcasm and ribbing in a way that is funny without being um, cruel, if you will. And certainly there's probably been times where I've maybe crossed that line. And anytime you're, you know, you do this type of thing, you, you, you sometimes maybe say something you regret. But I don't have too many regrets over the years. I look back at some of my early videos and like some of the shit I was doing with Nigel and <laughs> all this stuff. And I was like, it was fucking wild. But like, you know, those are the years. It's like, listen... This is the internet. It's like, how can you set yourself apart? Do things that are outrageous. And people pick different venues and mediums to do outrageous things in. And I was always proud of the fact that I was able just to do it out of my house without fucking bothering anybody, without going into a Home Depot and being a cocksucker to people in public, you know, like all that type of shit that is just the worst. It's like, man. So that's something I'm super proud of that I've been able to just like, Kind of like the the PewDiePie type beat. Just sit at a desk, talk your shit, build an audience, and um, I don't know. I don't take that for granted. I'm 
I'm, I'm super blessed. And then the last couple of years, it's turned into things like body cams. You know, there was insufferable again, Instagram for years. We do some body cams now and it's all kind of the same type of thing. The brain worms, the theme remains the same because the ultimate reality is there is a human condition that negative emotion elicits the greatest reaction. So the easiest way to get someone to click on a video oftentimes is to present them with something that they don't like. <laughs> I'm not saying that correctly. There's obviously a lot of good ways to get people to click on a video, but this is clearly one of the ways. If you spent any time on the internet, you've seen these tactics. So, you know, I look at themes of, of videos I've made, like insufferable brat gets what she deserves. A couple of videos that have done really well on my channel. Like there's nothing that people like more than seeing karma bite somebody, right? And then I've been able to leverage that and make some videos that people enjoyed. But um, yeah, I, I, the last few, the last year, like six months, maybe 18 months, I've just been in a bit of a creative rut as far as my personal channel. And I'll kind of explain to you what I mean by that. Oftentimes people that start YouTube or a lot of businesses, musicians, whatever it is, you have nothing to lose. You're fully creative. You're not reliant on this thing, right? It's not paying your bills. It's not feeding your family. It is just go mode and you're doing everything. You're creating, you're doing all this stuff. And then there's a kind of a long transition period. If you're fortunate enough to turn this type of thing into something that supports you, there's a transition where you now are a business owner. You now have all the administrative headaches, the emails, all of these stuff that come with running a business, which is fine. But that's other stuff that's taking up your time that you didn't have before that you had to kind of put towards the creative process. And now you're making money and it's paying your bills. You're su it's supporting you. And it's if it's just you, that's one thing. If you're older and you have a, a wife and a family that you support and whatever else, what other financial obligations you start to have, these obligations that as a man, as a provider, these are very important things, right? So- that type of thing starts to take priority over everything else. And so there's kind of this give and take. It's like, all right, I can continue to try to be creative, but if I can do this thing that I know works and is proven and doesn't take a lot of effort, I'm going to continue to do that because it makes sense and it, and it makes money. And it's easy to eventually just be uh, on the hamster wheel. And that can take a lot of energy. So I think for me, one of the things in the last five or six years that has really suffered is mostly my, you know, my love for music. You know, when I started doing the commentary stuff before it was a full-time job, I was incorporating music more. I was doing some diss tracks and stuff. Like I said, I think some of the stuff that really got me some attention to begin with, because it was unusual. It was like, Hey, here's this commentary guy, but he's, he also can sing and he can make some creative songs and stuff like that. That's certainly taking a seat on the back burner because it just, it wasn't the stuff that was making money. It's higher effort for me at the time in my genre and my demographic of the content I was making, it was harder to make in getting the least amount of results. So as an analyst or someone who's looking at analytics or like, what do we do more of? What do we do less of? That's, that's the type of thing that, that starts to go to the wayside when you are like, all right, now I'm supporting a family, all these things. So these are just like little things I've I noticed over the years. And eventually it's kind of like, it can be the slow death of creativity if you let it. I don't want to give you the misconception. Like I still spend time being creative in other ways, obviously in the videos I make, I'm writing certain bits. I'm doing jokes here and there, but to create an original work on its own, independent of other content being involved that you need to riff off of is a whole different experience. And that's something I'm really wanting to get back into. And for me, um, off camera, non-content related, I've been playing a lot of music again recently and it's been so awesome. I've written three songs on my old 1992 Fender Stratocaster and my old amp. I used to play my band, just having a, having a great time. And I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm plotting. I'm plotting. As you can see, if you're watching this, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing here. Okay. I am I'm hypothesizing. I'm plotting my country boy, my country boy era. I don't know how it's going to be, but if I can get this mullet going nice and like throw on a cowboy hat and like write some cool songs, you know, all the music I've done previously has been satirical. 
I think I could have a pretty good go at writing actual music. And I don't know what that, you know, what, what the fuck? We'll see what happens. So I might like make an EP. And if I did do it, it, it would be, I'd want it to be, I would probably find someone locally to help me record like some professional looking videos. It's funny. Cause like I've seen this kind of resurgence on YouTube recently of just this kind of this raw live performance type of video, you know, which was huge a decade plus ago and then fell off for a while. And now I feel like just real music performances of people singing their heart out with their instrument that never gets old, right? Music changes, genres change, but someone just sitting down with an instrument and delivering a meaningful performance, I don't think will ever get old. There will always be an audience for that. And that is, I find something that I gravitate towards something that really inspires me and compels me to want to be more creative. So I'm trying to get back into that in an effort to start to start to nourish that part of me again. I also want to do some more writing. I hate how debilitated I've become in the last decade or so in my profession, involved in social media. And I'm, if I'm being honest, I think I use the fact that I'm in, I do social media, quote unquote. I think I use that as an, as an excuse for like just mind numbing endless consumption of shit that is insubstantial. I go through phases where I really make an effort to make sure I'm consuming things that are nourishing my soul and my brain, but I have a hard time sustaining it because this, the draw, the, the phone in my pocket with cheap dopamine is very compelling, right? And I know you can relate to that. It is so compelling that the thought of sitting down for an hour without that in like just writing or doing something, some sort of kind of like deep work that takes uninterrupted focus that isn't rewarding in the moment that takes patience and time. It's hard when you're, when you're as addicted to devices and phones as I am. And I know so many of you guys listening to this are, are like, yeah, that's me. Or you're like, no, that's not me. But I'm, but deep down you're like, you know, it is. <laughs> um, so that I feel like that's, that's the, adult, that's the struggle as an adult. Now it's like, how do you, obviously there's like, yeah, you have your job, you take care of family and stuff, but there is just so much opportunity to change the course of who you are, the course of your, like, there's, there's so many, there's so much rich opportunity waiting for anyone on the other side of our cheap dopamine addictions. And like, Listen, these things, these devices changed my life. I love them. They're useful. They're, they're a utility, but it, it is a bit of a superpower these days, I think, to be able to have the focus to, to do meaningful things, meaningful things that can really sharpen the sword of your character, that can strengthen your soul and give you the tools needed to traverse a difficult world right now. And we're just so susceptible to getting sucked into the fucking tornado of, of everything just constantly vying for the attention of our eyeballs and our ears. So this is, this is something I think about a lot. Um, and it's funny too, because, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I've, I've been enjoying doing this podcast too, because yes, it's content, but I like to think that there's some people out there listening that find value in kind of this unfiltered, unedited, longer form insight from somebody who's my age, who's in this industry that I like to think has a, has a pretty good head on my shoulders, as opposed to the other side of the content spectrum, which is like short form stuff, right? Like if you really think about it, if you, if you actually... If you're honest with yourself, in the last six months, how many short form videos have you consumed that you can genuinely say, wow, that was impactful. I really, that helped change something or did something, ignited something in you. I'm not saying they don't exist. There's useful things, like little things that come up once in a while. I'm like, oh, that's a fun tidbit. But so much of the short form shit that's put out is just brainwave filler. It's like nothing. It's you're just swiping and it's nothing. It is lobotomizing us. Swipe after swipe after swipe after fucking swipe. It is slowly like a hammer and a chisel at our frontal lobe, 
just chiseling out the wrinkles of our brain, smoothing it like a fucking paver. And it's just a death by a thousand paper cuts and we all kind of know what's going on, but we don't care because it feels good. Just little fucking, oh yeah, one after the other. Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Oh, give me that. And the people on the other end are like, oh yeah, the attention. Fuck, look at how many views that got. Fuck yeah, this one banged. Fuck yeah. Let's do another video that is meaningless. That's going to get a bunch of fucking views because we're all so fucking brain dead. We're just scrolling and scrolling and fucking our phones with our face. Oh, it feels good. And the next thing you know, you're a full-blown fucking retard. Sorry, the second glass of whiskey just hit, I think. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I like to go on those tangents, though. What can I say? I don't have the answers, man. I don't. I don't know that there is an answer. I think there's a use for short form, and I'm singling that out. But I just, it's just something I am constantly thinking about because the second I take my eye off the ball, I'm consumed by it. The second I'm not being self aware, and I say that I'm saying this into the microphone right now, like as I've been in a, a, a downward spiral of like doom scrolling at 2 a.m. and like going to bed. Oh, I'm going to bed on time tonight. I'm in bed by 12 30. I'm going to get good sleep. Quarter or two rolls around. My fucking eyes are bleeding. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Idiot. Put the phone down, you cock. <sighs> Brutal. But um, as far as my YouTube career, I, I want to, again, I want to chat about the Olympics in a moment just because of that video I uploaded today, which is a little bit of a pivot. But as far as, as, far as my content goes, and I, I didn't even touch on uh, Lush Life, which is a channel I do with my wife. And it's funny. So many of you guys I know watch that. And I imagine that a lot of you guys that listen to this podcast probably watch that too. Cause I feel like there's the main channel has its own audience. And then lush life is kind of a thing of its own now because it's just a different dynamic when my wife's involved. And I did want to say I've really lush life has been wonderful, right? It's been such a, a, a breath of fresh air and something wonderful for me. And honestly, I think for my relationship with my wife, because I know what we're doing is in no way revolutionary or original or crazy. We're literally sitting down and watching videos that are curated for us, but there's something about it that I think people really relate to. You know, we're using the videos as a vehicle to showcase our banter, our relationship. And that's really all it is. Like there's no plan we don't script anything. We just go in and we watch these things and whatever comes out of our mouth comes out of our mouth. And obviously that's not for everybody. There's going to be people that watch this and are like, well, I was boring. I don't care for these people. And that's, that's fine. That's the internet. But there's, there's people out there that have really gravitated towards that channel. I think because if I'm being self, you know, if, if I'm analyzing it, like there's not a lot of examples of just normal, healthy couples on the internet. You know, like, like, and not to say like, listen, we have our problems as every married couple does, but I like to think that we're a pretty normal, healthy couple. And I'm very blessed because of that. And in, in some weird way, the Lush Life channel, I think for a lot of people, it's less about the videos and more about just like hanging out with a normal married couple, which can be cool for people that... Maybe you're going through something in life or, or feeling a little bit lonely or something like that. And it's such a strange thing, but like I, there's something so special about that channel. And, you know, like, and for her too, like there's, there's been a, it's been a meme for years that like, I basically just forced her to do it. And I, and I did to begin with, <laughs> she never had aspirations to be online. She's self-conscious. She doesn't want to be like, all of these things. She was n never, probably to this day, would have ever posted even an Instagram reel like saying a word if it wasn't for me. And I think there's something charming about that because she is a normie. She is most of the people that are just trying to go through life getting by, right? She's not out here fucking, yeah, I don't know. You get what I'm trying to say. So there, there's something, it's funny because like it, the way we do our channel, like it's not, it's not the type of content that's going to, that's going to go nuts and blow up or whatever. I'm not trying to create super viral content. It's just like, Hey, if you like watching uh, a couple, watch a few videos and you can, you can relate to us anyway, or maybe, you know, I, I think a lot of our audience is probably in our age group, maybe in their thirties. 
I'm sure there's some younger ones too, but I get a lot of messages from other couples that are like, oh, me and my boyfriend or me and my husband, we love to watch you guys after dinner or whatever. And there's just something so cool about that, man. And, you know, if you're, if you're listening, you watch any of my content at all, just, just know I appreciate you. Know that I don't really know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, every morning I wake up and I'm trying to figure it out. The only North Star that has kept me going for this long is like, hey, let's do our best to just uh, put our best foot forward, be ourselves, try to make some funny jokes. Hopefully we can make people laugh. And then when my wife's involved, just don't. I mean, there is, and you've you've seen me just roll my eyes. Like I, there's nothing that gives me the ick worse than contrived cringe couples content on the internet. You know, the stuff that gets all the views, like the the, the 50, 20 million YouTube reels, 20 million Instagram reel plays, just, you know, the type of shit I'm talking about. So if we can be even a drop in the bucket that is the counterbalance to that type of drivel, I feel good about that. That's my feeling on that because I know, you know, there there is part of me that's like, well, Leon, you can't, it's weird to, it's weird to take pride in this channel where you're like, again, back to the creativity thing. Like I'm not creating anything standalone, incredible. I'm not writing this beautiful video and doing all this crazy thing. I'm not whatever. It's just us sitting down and watching shit. But in some weird way, that is the essence of YouTube, kind of, (laughs) you know, something about that. I mean, fuck, people love watching other people play video games. It's no surprise that they love watching other people watch videos. So that's been really a breath of fresh air. And it's been it's been helpful, too, just in in the grand scheme of the business. um, As I waffle a little bit personally on my main channel with with the direction and what I'm doing there, as I've again approached 40 and kind of in this midlife crisis of identity as I become an adult and my interests and my needs and desires change, et cetera. If you guys are listening or you're watching right now, if you're listening, obviously not, but if you're watching uh, and you have any specific questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Obviously the podcast is at a place right now where I can read through the comments quite easily without getting lost. Like I do sometimes on the main chain, but the French, the Paris summer Olympics. So I don't want to talk too much about the Olympics themselves, but kind of like a, an extrapolation of what has come from the Olympics and everything going on in this world. And this, this might be kind of an indictment on myself and how I spend my time because I I do, you know, I sometimes rag on myself for being terminally online. And I think part of that is like just spending too much time on Twitter and I don't know, like, so the Olympics comes out and immediately there's controversy over the opening ceremonies. And then a couple of things happen. And then there's this huge controversy over the women's boxing where there's this, uh, you know, a woman, alleged. I mean, I, I still don't know the real answer, but this woman who is, I guess, being accused of being a man and demolishing this Italian female boxer. And it's brings up this whole controversy of biological men competing in women's sports, which is something that's not new. I mean, we've seen this before with the whole, obviously, progressive trans movement and this push to allow trans women to compete in women's sports with biological women. And and again, like when I say this could be an indictment on me, like maybe I'm just spending too much time in a place where algorithms are feeding me this shit that gives me a skewed perception of how this is being received. Like I like to imagine there's a world where there's a lot of people that just watch the Olympics and we're like, Hey, this is cool. This is fine. And then they turn them off and, <laughs> And that's it. But the world I live in, it's just everything is a controversy. Everything that happens, someone's upset about it and it becomes politicized to the point where you can't, to the point where I can't even like upload a video about it and make, a, take a couple of jabs uh, without, you know, the comment section going nuts. And I guess that's okay. But in this particular video, I, I just, I uploaded it earlier today. And by the way, <clears throat> this was sick. I like recorded it. Got it edited. I thought it was a very funny video, actually. It was one of those videos and I was talking about earlier where like I spent a little time putting together a loose, you know, order of how I was going to do things. I didn't really write any jokes. Um, Sometimes I just like to go in cold. If I'm feeling in the mood, I'm like, let's just go in and we'll just off the cuff. Let's see what happens. And that was one of those times I thought it came out really well. And I upload it and it's like, oh, cool. And just gets cocked by copyright. It's like the French Olympic committee, three clips get copyrighted. I mean, I wasn't, there was a few clips, but it was not very heavy 
Olympic content. So I, I bad, I fought it. I was like, fuck this. No. And for those of you unaware, I won't bore you with the, the backend interface of how you deal with copyright issues on YouTube, but you can essentially appeal it or you can dispute it, which is like, Hey, I don't think this is appropriate. And the other party has 30 days to look at it and review. And if they say no, then you can appeal it, which gets more serious because if you appeal it and the other party comes back and still says, no, I want to escalate this. Now it gets to a point where you have a couple options, either you get lawyers involved or they can try to, they can try to deliver a copyright strike to your video, which gets it taken down on YouTube and your channel gets a copyright strike, which is very bad because if you get a, like two or three of them, it can get your channel terminated. And it's also very bad because who the fuck wants to get lawyers involved. But what I've learned in my years on YouTube <clears throat> is this is a system that gets abused very heavily by all types of organizations, clip farms, media conglomerates, they just go around, they, they, if there is a whiff of any sort of content that they might have rights to, even if it's like a two second clip in a 20 minute video, completely insubstantial, obviously fair use, not a replacement for the original content, they will strike your video and try to claim all of the revenue. This has been happening for years. And when it became a real bad problem in 2017, 18, everyone kind of got bullied out of it. And you're like, well, you, you, you're like, I, I don't have the money. I can't go to court against these, 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 these media conglomerates, WMG, these music labels. Like, what the fuck am I going to do? But what I've come to learn is that these motherfuckers will just bully you all the way up to the point where they have to spend money on lawyers. And then if it is actually fair use, they'll buckle. So, you know, it's different if you're just like ripping and re-uploading content, like stealing content and uploading it. Sure. But if you're per doing like, a review, a reaction, a movie review, critical commentary, type of shit that I do where you're like taking clips of things and, and making a longer cohesive video about it. That is fair use by definition. There's obviously some gray area there, but fuck you. Okay. Fuck you. You're going to try to, you're going to try to keep, not only was the revenue, whatever, like I lose revenue on videos. They get demonetized all the time. I'm used to that, but they blocked it. And this was the problem. So like there was three clips that got copyrighted and it was like blocked. Can't even upload it. So I disputed all three videos and YouTube now as a way to bypass the dispute and go directly to the appeal. So I was like, fuck this. I don't even want to give him, I was like, go give me right to the finish line. Like, Hey, either drop this fucking copyright claim or, you know, whatever lawyer up, see what happens or try to deliver a copyright strike. And so I sent that dispute or that appeal for all three clips. And then on the dashboard, it was like, all right, this is pending these appeals. They're going to have to respond in seven days. But since you appealed it, you can upload the video. It's not blocked anymore. It was just demonetized. So I hit, so I published it and I, it like broke. Like it didn't actually go live, I guess. And then two hours later, it was live, but it wasn't. Like it was live, but it was blocked. Uh, then I won the appeals. They dropped all of them. And so I had to unlist it and republish it, <clears throat> but it was already fucked. So like no notifications went out, nothing. These are just stupid dumbass problems with my job that are of no consequence to you guys. I'm just venting a little bit here. Uh, anyways, all that's to say the video got a little bit cucked. So I'm like, oh, great. I, I worked hard on this. I thought it was funny. And now um, <clears throat> no notifications go out, but you know, it will surface and, and some people will find it. It's just not going to be like a normally viewed video. But it, the weird thing about YouTube though is as well, like if the video is good and people are enjoying it over time, it will slowly maybe find a bigger audience. That is one thing I do give credit for. There is no there's truly no better to, well, I shouldn't say that. They have a pretty good discovery system. If the video is good, even if it starts off shitty, the algorithm's pretty good at finding an audience for videos that are, are good. And I've definitely made a lot of videos that aren't good. <laughs> so, and I've made a lot of videos that are very good, I guess, that don't find an audience and some that I didn't think were good that do. I guess I just don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, really. That's what I'm trying to get at. But this fucking Olympics thing, right? So I've had this thing recently, like anytime, you know, with the, with the, tra the, the boxing thing, which obviously brings in the gender issue, all of this stuff is so hyper politicized. And I'm wondering, like, do normal people know about this shit? Like if I, like, if I were to go to like a normal office job and be like, Hey, did you hear about, um, you know, the Olympics, the women's boxing thing with like that, that woman who's like maybe a man and she's beating the piss out of girls and there's this huge controversy. Would most people be like, no, nah, I have no fucking clue what you're talking about. Or is that like, I, I sometimes think I'm in this microcosm 
of very politicized controversies because I spend too much time online and it's giving me a skewed view of the world. But on the flip side, I also think that we're just becoming more and more polarized at the same time. So maybe I'm not too far off base thinking this is permeating. And I mean, listen, not for nothing, but I mean, look at what's transpired over the last couple of weeks with Mr. Beast and Ava Tyson and Nick Merckx. Uh, so, you know, for a, there's a lot of people that are like, anytime I even skirt around something that could possibly be political, people are like, oh, Leon, I can't believe I hate, I come to you because I want to escape all that stuff. And I'm like, dude, I get it, man. I'm not trying to sit up here on a soapbox and preach to you about what you should believe. But like these things permeate everything online. Everything is politicized now. It's impossible to escape it. So it's inevitable that occasionally something like this will enter into a video and I'll make a joke about it. And I'm just going to tell it how it is, right? Like I'm, I'm not going to skirt around and fucking put on slippers and be gentle around fucking like, no, I'm going to make fun of trans people, gay people, fucking lesbian. I'm going to make fun of everybody. That's just how it is, right? That's the whole, like, if you want to be included, you want equality, you're going to get shit on like everybody else. But I can't do a video like this without just the comments being like, uh, ugh. I took a few screenshots of some right here. Let me just pull this one. Where the fuck is it? What was this guy? He goes, uh, oh, he goes, your right wing turn is really sad to watch, brother. Thumbs up. I'm like, dude, first of all, I mean, it's probably no secret that I lean conservative, right? But it's like, what do you, what do you mean by right wing turn? Like, was I ever some sort of progressive Democrat? Like, I'm just making jokes about something. Like, why, what is that? Is it not possible to, and not only that, but like, the whole boxing situation, I gave a pretty measured take where I was very honest about how I feel about biological men in women's sports, which I think there's absolutely no place for that. And even that take is I'm catching flack for, for some reason. If you were born a man, I don't care how many fucking hormones you take, how much makeup you put on, what the surgeon does to your shit, you should not be competing with biological women. Period. P-E-R-O-I-D-T. <laughs> I think that's how black people say it. At least that's what I saw on black Twitter once. That's my take. But in this case with Imani, this girl, this, this, uh, whatever, whatever the fuck she is, that's been re wrecking girls and being accused of being a man. And I'm not going to get into it because I talk about it more in the video. Um, it, it's a little more convoluted, a little more gray area. Like she, there's, it's, it's weird. Like the, the conservatives think there's proof that because of this failed test, but there's a lot of information that that test was phony and delivered by a corrupt Russian boxing organization that was trying to dethrone her because their only undefeated boxer got beat by her. There's a lot, there's just so much crazy information out there. And then there's other people that have some compelling evidence that she is a biological female that was born a male with just a unusual condition that exhibit some male characteristics. Maybe she has higher testosterone. Maybe she took testosterone. Like who the fuck knows? But I can't even talk about that without people like, oh, well, I'm really sad to see your right wing turn, Leon. Boy, boy, I can't believe you became a Nazi, Leon. Oh my God. Motherfucker, shut the fuck up. You don't like, you don't know me. Let me make jokes. And it's my own fault for going in the comments and looking at these fucking, the dude's name, like, I don't want to call him out. The, the dude's name has Denver in it. And I mean, if there's a more liberal place than Denver, besides maybe San Francisco, I don't, and uh, I guess uh, Portland, Oregon. But I love the comments too, because there's so many, there's a lot of good people in the comments. So it's kind of like a, it's a double-edged sword. Because a lot of you guys are great. I love fucking around with you. I love getting in the comments and responding to some, but I see shit like that. And uh, it just is what it is. I know there's so many people that like, I could just stand up here and make videos and say whatever the fuck I wanted and never read a single comment and sleep like a baby at night. I still do sleep like a baby, but like, if I'm being honest, and one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because, you know, in my, in, in a lot of the videos I do, in most of my career on YouTube, I have remained relatively apolitical, but I, I try to make sure I never stop myself from delivering an honest take of what I think out of fear of what people will think on either side of the aisle. I also, in this same video, had multiple people in the comments disappointed in me. These are Christians. These are conservatives that one of them was like, I can't, I, I can no longer watch you. Unsubbed. 
because I was not as equally outraged as them over the opening ceremony of the Olympics that they thought was mocking the Last Supper with Jesus. There's a lot of information or a lot of comments saying that it wasn't even the Last Supper that was being mocked. It was more of a depiction of the Feast of Dionysus. But the whole controversy around that was the fact that they had uh, all these drag queens and trans models and blah, 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 kind of depicting what looked like a Last Supper thing. And uh, yeah, it basically, there's a lot of co- the whole conservative Christian cohort was like, this is a demonic mockery of our religion, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. There's been conflicting takes. I think even the director of the guy who was like in charge of putting the show on, I think apologized or said something about it. And, but, but people are still, you know, so it's like if he's alluding to the fact that it was kind of a parody of the last supper, then why are people in the comments like, well, nah, it wasn't that it was the festival of Dionysus. I don't know. And this is kind of the, this is kind of the catch 22 of the internet is that no matter what the fuck you believe or what the fuck you think, there's always going to be people or information that you can find that supports your view. And so that's why at the end of this video, I was ultimately like, I gave my take on the boxing thing. I was like, if you're born a biological man, don't think you should be fighting against women. But I don't know what the fuck, I don't know what she is. Half the people uh, you would swear by the way they're tweeting online have held his dick if it is a man and the other half you would swear have touched her ovaries and been inside her uterus they're so convinced she's not a man i'm just like i don't fucking know dude i don't fucking know anymore so my take is it's likely that this could be the case but i don't fucking know and then you get shit on for being a fence sitter and it's like well i told you my take if she's a man she shouldn't be foxing women but i don't fucking know i think there were a lot you know this was the type of thing since it was it was, you know, in the same camp as the most popular kind of controversy right now, which is gender and, and trans men, trans women, uh, at least in the politosphere and the, in the, in the, the left and right stuff. Um, it was, it was such a ripe opportunity for conservatives to try and dunk on everyone. So you saw everyone from JK Rowling all down the line, just making a tweet. There's no place for men and women's sport, blah, blah, blah. I get it. But then, like, if it really is a biological female that just has a disorder or something, is she not allowed to box? Now you look kind of stupid. Now you look like you just jumped the gun because you're just chomping at the bit. Any opportunity you have, just a little breadcrumb. You're so fucking hungry to say what you need to say. So, like, I think everybody sucks is what I'm trying to say. I see progressive, I see, I see progressive liberals out there that make me want to fucking, that make me scoff. I'm like, you are a fucking idiot. And then on the flip side, I see conservatives out there, Christian, whoever it is, where I'm like, I I may, I'm, I, and don't get me wrong. I'm pretty conservative for the most part in a lot of my leanings. There's some parts of me that are probably more liberal. Again, I'm, I'm relatively apolitical, but I see a lot of conservatives out there that I'm like, you're, you're just a pathetic grifter that would sooner cut your dick off before admitting you were wrong if it was something that didn't align with this particular ideology that you have been choking on the dick of for however long, whether that's because it's making you money or because it's become your whole identity. Like people have lost the ability to look at information that doesn't reaffirm their bias and even have a a twinge of a possibility of changing their opinion. We've, we've lost that ability at least. And and I think that's a, that I, I really think that is a, it's a consequence of how the most polar extremes are the things that seem to get amplified the most. I really think it is because if you, th- you know, you think about how the internet works, how these algorithm works, how these algorithms work, and like I said earlier, where negative things, things that elicit the biggest emotional reaction gain the most traction and it continues to to polarize further and further and further because those are always the voices getting amplified. It is never the nuance take. It is never the person that can try and see the validity or try and see the reason why both sides might feel the way they do and see if there's not some sort of common ground. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there's certain issues where there is some objective truth. I'm not trying to be like, oh, well, everything can be real and everything is true. And it's just, you know, as long as you're happy and you believe it, like, 
No, it's not what I'm saying. But I'm also saying that even if I believe something to be true, I can try and have respect for and try and come from a place of understanding of why someone might believe the opposite to an extent. And I just think there's there's not a lot of room for that on the internet anymore. You don't see that much anymore. So I don't care. You know, I talk about reading these comments and it's it's whatever. I, I, I clap back sometimes because I just, because I like it. But uh, it doesn't bother me. I've been doing this long enough. The, the comments don't bother me on a personal level. But I think I've just, for a long time, avoided it because I am kind of, through and through a purebred, I'm a bit of a people pleaser. So like I take no joy in upsetting people. I take no joy in saying things that make people disappointed or uh, uh, uncomfortable, right? But on the flip side of that, I think it's cowardly to not feel comfortable saying what you believe to be true because you're worried about upsetting somebody in your audience, or you're worried that it's going to affect your money or your paycheck or your sponsors. Right. But then there's the other flip side of that extreme, which is like the sneakos of the world where it's like, you just say the most inflammatory thing possible every day or two to get engagement. You know, that is a business model. If you can be the most aggressive, inflammatory personality in do very well on the internet. It comes with a lot of downsides, but you can definitely monetize that. But part of me wonders, like, do you really believe everything you're saying or are you just so caught up in the business model of engagement, <clears throat> knowing how to get the most engagement? You're obviously going to build an audience of loyalists who are polarized and extreme as well. And then on the flip side, you're going to get engagement from everybody else that can't believe you said that thing. I think it's going to be interesting navigating the next couple of years. Um, you know, just from my own personal perspective, I think that well, here's a good example. And we just talked about this. I think that YouTubers for years have been in large part notorious for being apolitical, avoiding controversy at all costs. And it's no secret why. I mean, the things we've had to do, the hoops we've had to jump through over the years to, stay monetized and avoid be, you know, to avoid being in the dog pen and stay in the good graces with old father Google who writes the checks. I've done plenty to try and make sure my content is sterile enough to not get me banned, but I've tried not to sacrifice my core essence for the sake of the almighty dollar, which is why I still swear. I mean, there was a, a period where I was censoring every swear and all these things. And I'm just like, ugh. Dude, it's like, man. But I just think that, you know, for years, it's been very easy to stay out of it. And it just feels like, weirdly, and maybe this is just me getting older, but it feels like it's a lot more difficult to completely stay apolitical. And we've seen that with Mr. B. Like, I would say Mr. Beast is the best example of someone who spends almost every ounce of his energy avoiding controversy at all costs. And then, <laughs> whoops, your right-hand man turned into your right-hand woman. And turns out they're like sexting kids. And now you have no choice but to be involved. And how involved were you? How much did you know? Blah, blah, blah. It's everywhere, man. And it seems like it's, <laughs> it seems like it's going to continue being everywhere. I, you know, I shouldn't say it seems like, it seems like it's going to continue to polarize. I'd like to talk more. I'd like to talk more in depth about that at some point, not in this podcast, just as a, you know, as a 39 year old father coming up, uh, you know, on my coming up in the beginning of my fifth decade, <laughs> some of my views have changed over the years. And I think some of the, you know, I think the way things have gone since I started YouTube, you know, from, from when I started YouTube to where they are now, things have, have gone a little bananas, a little haywire. And I hate this idea that if you don't uh, immediately accept every sort of new kind of thing that is being put forth as, you know, inclusion and equity and, love if you don't if you like if you just if you just kind of like pump the brakes and think like is this really hmm is this really the does this make sense should we talk about this a little bit if you even raise an eyebrow it's like you just get wrecked by like you're phobic oh why do you have so much hate in your heart why can't you just love why do you care what other people do all these things and i'm like dude i'm not i don't hate people dude i love people 
I love all types of people, but I'm also allowed to raise an eyebrow when things are looking a little crazy out there, you know? Anyways, the Olympics, there were some funny memes in the video too, by the way. If you hadn't seen it, you should go watch it. Uh, it wasn't all controversy. It was 50% controversy and 50% f cool, funny memes that came out of it. But as far as the future, Leon Lush, we'll see, man. I think, you know, one, one thing I did want to mention before I wrap up is I've gone through phases in the last year or two where I've, I've actually hired people to try and make like more professional, higher effort, like scripted content. And I think some of it did well, but there was part, like part of it was, it was me just like looking at data and like farming, like, all right, what's the thing I can talk about that's the most likely to get views. It was always through the lens of like, how can we optimize for the most amount of clicks? Like how we can get the best CTR, do the thumbnail. It's like, man, like, yes, that is the, probably the best way to do YouTube. And there's people that do that and make millions of dollars. But I just couldn't bring, like, it's, it's been really, it was really hard to bring myself to execute on these videos about things that I just didn't give a fuck about, even though they were things that were maybe going to be good for my YouTube channel. And so, you know, I've, I've done, I've experimented with a few things. I had to let one guy go who was really good. He was doing some good work for me. I just, I couldn't, it just wasn't, you know. I'm at an age where like, I have to go with my gut. I'm like, this isn't, maybe this makes the most sense for my shit. Like this would probably be good if I stuck with this for the next year and really grinded and like optimized every thumbnail and like farmed all these ideas and make these beautiful video essays. Like my channel would probably crush, but my gut was just telling me, Leon, man, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't it. This isn't what you're going to be doing for the next five years. And so I'm kind of back in that place where like, I think I'm at an age where I might just be going deeper instead of wider. And what I mean by that is focusing more on myself, what matters to me with the consideration of what people are interested in. Obviously we can't discredit that. You always have to think about like, all right, at least I want to talk about things that are interesting and at least will be valuable to people, but be valuable specifically to my audience. So thinking less about, you know, how can I get all the most amount of people to watch this and more so like, Hey, let's talk about things that are relevant to you and that probably could resonate with your audience because I think at this point I've been doing this long enough where most of the people, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be tourists that come in for the one, the, the video every once a year, or every other year when I have like a, a particular video pop off. But for the most part, you guys that have come back year after year, I think it's because of not the video itself, it's just because of how I deliver it, the takes and stuff like that. So I want to try and optimize for you guys. So that's going to be for me, less about how the thumbnail looks, less about picking the perfect topic, more about talking about things that are relevant, things that are going on, uploading more frequently in a way that is less planned and curated in more authentic, kind of in the, in the, in the Mudahar, the Oompaville, um, the PewDiePie vein, just hitting the record button and going for it. And, uh, I, at least that's what I think right now. I think that's what makes sense. I just think I need to to focus on trying trying to build that tribe and stop worrying about fucking bullshit metrics. I mean, I have I, I say this. I have such a a great amount of respect and envy for people like that. Clearly, don't give a shit about their thumbnails. They don't give a shit about the how they package it and present it. They are just so consistent. They show up for their audience to the point where. It can just be a picture of their face and a stupid title and people are going to click on it because they want to hear what they have to say. That's the type of YouTuber I look up to and I've looked up to for years. There's a lot of YouTubers that get millions and millions of views because they play the game correctly and their videos to me are just vapid. I would rather watch paint dry. And so I think I had that realization that like, okay, I, it, why does it make sense for me to try and make those types of videos when that's not the type of content I myself even like to consume. It's always a learning process, man. So these are just some of the thoughts I've had and wanted to, to share those with you just to, to get a little bit of a insight into how my thought process, my thought process is I'm definitely not going anywhere. I mean, there is a, there is a part of me that will always have to make some sort of content, whatever that is. Um, very, happy with how lush life is going with my wife. That's just been a blessing and it's 
it's, it's easy on the content front, but it's also fun. It's like, and I meant to say this earlier, but one of the reasons I love it is because it's, you know, it forces us to sit down together <laughs> every week and just hang out and chat shit and like randomly have moments of laughter. And when you're married to someone for a long time, like sometimes those moments start to dwindle. It's easy to get caught up in life when you have kids and your responsibilities. It's easy to let that shit slide. And to be able to do that because we quote unquote have to, we don't have to, but we do it for our our job, this channel. It's it's like it's double dipping almost. It's like, man, we have this channel that's doing well. It's providing income for our family. And it's also giving us an opportunity to just fucking hang out and laugh. So it's it's been a, an unbelievable blessing and something that's great. I think that will continue to be great for me as I traverse how I want to be someone, you know, the type of content creator I want to be over the next five years to a decade as I figure that and traverse that out. Um, but for those of you that have maybe been here for a while, man, what a what a treat to have you still here. And if you're new, yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that I can make something once in a while that, that makes you laugh or that makes you think. And I think that's, that's my only goal. And beyond that, look out for the era of <clears throat> Leon's cowboy country musician. We'll see what happens. I need to write about one. I need like one or two more songs to be written and then I'll have uh, enough for an EP and fuck coming down the pipe. That's it, man. Decently and decent episode 20. Thanks for listening. Salute. I'll talk to you next week. Peace.